The Old Testament lesson appointed for this first Sunday in Lent is recorded in the book of Genesis, the 22nd chapter. We begin at the first verse. Now, after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. Abraham said, Here I am. God said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering, and arose, and he went to the place of which God had told him. And on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes, and he saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering. He laid it on Isaac his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, My father, Abraham said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. And when they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there. He laid the wood in order, and he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. Abraham said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes, and he looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went, and he took the ram, and he offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, The Lord Will Provide. As it is said to this day, On the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice." This is the word of your Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is recorded in the book of James, the first chapter we begin at the 12th verse. James writes, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. So let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my, bro my beloved brothers. Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. This is the word of your Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel is recorded in the book of Mark, the first chapter. We begin at the ninth verse. Now in those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, and he was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, saying, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. As I'm sure you well know, there are times in life that the, the explanation, which is intended to make things easier, 
there are times that the explanation sometimes makes things more difficult. And today is one of those times. We listen to the epistle lesson and we hear some pretty basic, straightforward confessions about God. You know, God does not tempt anyone to sin, nor can God himself be tempted to sin. Simple enough, right? And yet the gospel is about Jesus, God himself in the flesh, being tempted in the wilderness. And it was the Holy Spirit of God that led him out into the wilderness to be tempted. I mean, the Gospels just made that simple statement in James a whole lot more difficult to understand, right? Then you look to the Old Testament lesson, particularly in the original Hebrew text, and you find that God nasad Abraham. That is, God tested or tempted Abraham. And yeah, that word can be and is translated both ways, tested or tempted. That's what nasa means. It all depends on the context. So you read it, and it says, God nasad Abraham. And we say, well, God tempted Abraham? Absolutely not, right? That cannot be. God tempts no one, like James says. Which is why then we translate it as God tested Abraham. And, and that's supposed to somehow make it easier to understand, right? Easier to reconcile the words of James with the reality that we see playing out on the ground with Abraham. God tested Abraham. But even here, right, things aren't magically somehow easier by simply saying that God tested Abraham. I mean, this opens up a whole other set of problems. How is testing really any better? I mean, did God not already know Abraham's heart? Why would God need to test Abraham? Did, did God not already know how this was going to turn out? Because if that's the case, well, then that would make God not really omniscient. You know, and that's a huge problem. If God's not omniscient, if God's not all-knowing, well, then he's not God. You hear that? You say, well, of course, Almighty God's omniscient and all-knowing. Yeah. And yet, just before Abraham faithfully plunges the knife into his son's chest, the angel of the Lord, who is pre-incarnate Jesus in the form of the angel, just before Abraham slaughters his son, God basically stops him and says, well, now I know that you're faithful. Now you know? You didn't know beforehand? That doesn't sound very omniscient. And let's not ignore the fact that testing someone's devotion, testing someone's faithfulness, that sounds more like something that an insecure 15-year-old drama queen would do with her boyfriend. That doesn't sound like anything a loving, almighty, all-knowing God would do. Here's a thought. Hear me out. Maybe it's our understanding in all of this that's the problem. Now, first off, there's the simple misunderstanding of the word itself, right? We hear test, and we automatically think in terms of you know, presenting obstacles, presenting tests that, in order to discover if the test subject me measures up. You know, we don't know, right? That's why we test. What's going to be the outcome? How will they fare? pass or fail? Let's find out. This is how we think. So, so the automatic assumption then is that, well, this is what God must be thinking and doing with Abraham. And we forget the fact that testing, scripturally, well, it also carries with it the meaning of exercising, strengthening, purifying. I mean, this is the testing that God speaks of in Isaiah, right? Using the imagery of the, the master refiner who nasas, that is, who purifies, who tests the precious metal in the furnace of affliction, burning away all that sinful, deadly chaff. Now, do you think God could have been exercising and refining and strengthening Abraham's faith in all this? I mean, as great as Abraham was, he was still human. He still wore sinful flesh, just like all of us. I think sometimes we forget that. You know, here on this mountaintop, God is exercising. God is strengthening the faith by teaching Abraham and really teaching all of us a lesson on true stewardship. Right? God is the one who gave Isaac as a precious gift of life to Abraham and Sarah, both of whom were as good as dead in terms of childbearing. God gives this gift. And God, as the fount and source of all gifts, also has every right to take that gift back. I mean, these gifts are his. They belong to him. 
We are but mere stewards and caretakers of the gifts, gifts that he has entrusted to us. Now, another misunderstanding with the idea of God testing Abraham, and, and I've already alluded to this, why was God testing Abraham? Why? Right? Who needed the answers? Who needed the proof regarding Abraham's faithfulness? <laughs> Not God. God's the one who justified Abraham, right? God's the one who declared Abraham righteous and pure long before this mountaintop test, right? 30 plus years earlier, as a matter of fact. That was a, a justification, a declaration that was based already then on the saving faith of Abraham. Abraham believed, and it, that faith, was counted to him as righteousness. So God didn't need to conduct a test in order to discover if Abraham was faithful. God already knew that answer. He already knew the outcome all along. I mean, when you think about it, this is just like God in the Garden of Eden after Adam and Eve had sinned. You know, where, where are you, Adam? What have you done? God already knew the answers to those questions. He wasn't asking for his benefit, but for the benefit of his beloved children. We get back to this text. In the original Hebrew, right, the way that this verb, to know, as in now I know, the way this verb is constructed, you know, yada is the verb, um, the way it's constructed here in this particular verse, it, it gives the meaning that would better be translated as now I have caused to know. So not now I know, but now I have caused to know. So again, it's not that God was somehow deficient in this wisdom until that moment of epiphany. You know, well, now I know. No, that's not the case. Rather, it's, it's through this exercise in faith that God is causing this knowledge to be made known. And to this day, God is using, he's still using this event to make known what the obedience of faith, what total trust in the Lord, even when things seem to make no sense. God is using this event to make it known. That, you know, this is what faith looks like in action. This knowledge that God makes known, this is for our benefit, not his. In fact, the book of Hebrews makes this clear when it tells us that Abraham fully trusted that God would raise Isaac from the dead. Why? Well, because God had promised that it was through Isaac that the Messiah would be born. And Isaac wasn't married yet, was he? He was still a kid. Isaac didn't have kids of his own yet. But if God said that the Messiah would be a descendant of Isaac, and God also said to put Isaac to death, you know, and God doesn't lie, well, then that means that God is going to have to raise Isaac from the dead because Isaac still has to get married and have kids. So when Abraham tells his servants to stay here while I and the boy go over there and worship, and then we'll both come back to you, when Abraham said that, he wasn't kidding. He fully believed it. He trusted in God. And it is this profound trust, it's this profound faith that God is still causing to be made known for our benefit today. You say, all right, well, let's think on this some more. What else has God caused to be made known for our sake? you know, for our good, for our salvation. Well, look to the cross, right? Look and listen to what God himself is declaring from this mountaintop altar of wood and blood. What is God causing to be made known here? And don't overthink it, because it's staring you in the face. Here on this cross, God is making clear, in no uncertain terms, what he thinks about your sin. God's making the reality of your sin and his wrath against that sin. He's making it plain as day. Do not be deceived, right? Jesus Christ, but God himself in the flesh, makes known from this bloody altar of sacrifice, he's making known that his own father has forsaken him. Right? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus already knows the answer to that question. He's not asking that question because he's somehow deficient in wisdom and, and really doesn't know, he doesn't understand. Jesus is the one who drew the plan for our salvation up before the foundation of the world. This is how it had to be. There's no other way. Jesus knew that if he wasn't forsaken by his Father, well then, we would be forsaken by the Father. So by asking this heart-rending, terrifying question, Jesus is causing to be made known the fact that he was truly forsaken in our place, in our stead. 
Jesus endured the true hell of being forsaken and forgotten by God for us in our place. So this question, this knowledge, this was causing to be made known. This was being made known for our benefit, for our faith. Now, at the same time, I want you to look at this cross, right? Because it's here on this cross that God causes to be made known his incomprehensible, his unconditional love for the very sinners who put his only begotten son on that cross. Us. You know, here is God's love for you, and it's on full display. It's here on this cross. Here, here is where God is making the knowledge of complete forgiveness of all sin. Here's where he's making that knowledge known to all men. Right? It is finished. There's no reason to fret. There's no more reason to worry or doubt. You know, what, did, what do I need to do on my part? Have I done enough? No. No additional works are necessary. Why would they be? You know, what, what can sinful man possibly add to this anyway? This is why Jesus says, it is finished. This blessed knowledge that Jesus is causing to be made known from that bloody sacrificial altar, this is for our sake. This is for our benefit. Yeah, and the same can be said for holy baptism, holy communion. It's through these means of grace that God makes abundantly clear the knowledge of his sacrificial love for you. He attaches his word, his promise of blood-bought forgiveness and everlasting life. He attaches that word and promise to water, right? Ordinary water. And then he tells you in no uncertain terms that baptism now saves you. He says, be baptized for the forgiveness of all your sin. He says, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. You need to think on all that for a moment. Satan is always tempting you to doubt the efficacy of your baptism. What has God already told you? What knowledge, through the working of the Holy Spirit himself in that word, what knowledge has God already caused to be made known to you? You know, if the almighty, omniscient God says that in his bapt His baptism saves you, his baptism forgives you all your sins and makes you his blessed heir, if the almighty, omniscient God says this, well, then who can say different? Guys, this knowledge is for you, for your blessed assurance, for your peace. The Holy Communion, the same exact reality, folks. As often as you do this, remember what I have said. This is my body, this is my blood given and shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sin. Jesus first made this known on Monday, Thursday at the Last Supper, and he continues to make this known each and every time we come together in worship to hear, to hear the word that he has attached to this supper. Right? As often as you do this, be remembering what I have said this is. Jesus causes this blessed sacramental knowledge to be made known for you every time the words of institution are spoken in order to give you his blessed assurance, his confidence, his joy, his peace, even as you make your way through this dark valley of the shadow of death with, with temptations coming at you from all sides. Right? He says, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And you know, with, with all this God-given knowledge through faith, I will fear no evil because I know Based on the knowledge that you have caused to be made known to me, Lord, for my sake, I will fear no evil, because thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You know, God causes to, to make all this, he, he makes all this blessed Christ-centered knowledge of your salvation. He causes it to be made known each and every time his word is heard. Faith comes through hearing, right? And with all that said, May our Lord's blessed knowledge for you and for all men, and it is for all men, because God so loved the whole world, right? May, may this blessed knowledge continue to be heard and known and trusted by you, and may it continue to be made known through you. May all those people that God brings you into contact with throughout the course of your daily life, may they too come to know and hold fast in faith to the very real and present love that God has for them in Christ, through you. May God grant this all for the sake of Jesus. Amen.